heads up because you are in the hoodwood. I'm the Black Bandit, KJ Green, welcoming you to another edition of Sports from the Hoodwood, October 27th, 22. Coming up this week, the Phillies and Astros. Is this a David versus Goliath situation in the World Series? Break it all down. What's wrong with the legends? Another lackluster performance from Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady. Take a look in depth. Is it time for the Lakers to blow it all up and move on, especially from Russell Westbrook? Take a look in depth. NFL Week 8 picks. The Hoodwood Hot 5. That can head slap. And I'm picking a fight in the final war for the wood. All that and a whole lot more. Strap yourselves in, put your crash helmet on, get ready. Sports of the Hood we're coming at you. Let's go! Snuffy at? Can somebody tell me, dog? Where you at? My mascot's gone. Snuffy's usually back there with something to say. I'm gonna figure out where this dog is. We'll get to that here in a little bit. Again, my name is KJ Green. I'm the Black Bandit, welcoming you to another exciting episode of Sports from the Hoodwood. And let's start with baseball. The Astros and the Phillies. Then there were two. Now, the Astros keep on winning, and they swept the Yankees aside like more or less a bothersome distraction than a real rival, and they're on their way to their fourth World Series in five years, which starts Friday in Houston. Now, the mighty Philadelphia Philbirds, uh, uh, Phillies, I'm okay, 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 I know I said that they would get swept aside by the Cardinals, that was two series ago. That didn't happen, and I know I thought that the Braves would be so much better, and the Phillies bludgeoned them into submission. The NLCS was supposed to be a seven-game fight to the death between two underdogs in the Phillies and the Padres. You know, the Padres had their big names like Juan Soto and Manny Machado, and this was supposed to be a heavyweight fight. They had a solid pitching rotation, but what did the fighting Phils do behind Bryce Harper and JT Relamuto and Reese Hoskins? They slugged their way to a five-game series win and their first pennant since 2009. Now, they face an Astros team that has been really businesslike and just ripping through the American League playoffs. They demolished the plucky Mariners in a three-game sweep, though the Mariners hung on and hung tough in an 18-inning just marathon, but the Astros pulled that out. Then, facing a formidable Yankee squad in the ALCS, this was supposed to be a classic showdown, but instead it was a classic beatdown in the boogie-down Bronx. I, 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 don't, I couldn't call it. The, the Yankees just looked weak. And it was a four-game sweep, and it wasn't that close. The Astros pitching, led by staff anxious, the youngster Framber Valdez. He's a, just just a good-looking young ball player. And the wily future Hall of Famer Justin Verlander. They had the Yankees' number. They had them on lock. They couldn't get hits. And they made the Yankees' bats disappear. It was, it was, it was sad watching the Yankees struggle and struggle and struggle. And then the, the, the Astros, they got timely hitting from Jose Altuve, uh, Yuli Gurriel, Alex Bregman. All of them were just hitting a ton. And they simply wore out Yankee pitching. And that, that's pretty much the way it looked. It, it, the Yankees pitching could not get them out, not when it needed to be. And, hey, keep an eye on those snappy youngsters. Uh, Jeremy Pena, who won ALCS MVP, 
And the rest of that young pitching staff to have to die for, my goodness. The aforementioned Valdez, Christian Javier, and Luis Garcia. And that's a one, two, three punch that the Astros going to rely on well after Justin Verlander is called a career, which no one says he's calling a career, but they still have an embarrassment of riches in pitching, and, and they look good. Now, we haven't even mentioned Trey Mancini, who came over from the Orioles, and gave gives them just that much, that just another punch in that stacked lineup. The Yankees had few answers, and the answers they had were mostly wrong. The presumptive MVP, Aaron Judge, I think he is. I think him and Snuffy went fishing because he didn't do anything. He batted. One for 16 in the ALCS. Now, my UC math says that's 063. If you're batting under 100 for any postseason uh, series, something's wrong. Something's really wrong. And other than Harrison Bader, nobody in the Yankees squad hit. Nobody. Bader hit 400, and he was the only one who hit above 200 for the Yankees in that series. It was sad. Like I said, it was sad. Yankees were missing in action and in no position to seriously defend to, de- I should say, not to defend. The Astros are defending AL uh, champs, but they had no chance to defeat the defending AL champs who look very much the part in the sweep. So now, like I said before, there are two. The 87 Winfields who dawdled, hemmed, and hawed their way down the stretch, going a very pedestrian 14 and 17 from September 1st on. I mean, they lost two or three to the Astros. Now, who would have thought that was a World Series preview, yeah? Go figure. But now, the Phils got hot in the postseason. We already know what they did to the Cards and what they did to the, to the Padres and the Braves. It, it, they got hot right when they needed to. Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler have been aces in their own right, and they look very much so in the NL playoffs. But the Astros. I mean, let's, let's keep it real. Do the fighting Phils have a fighting chance? I mean, the Phils are plucky, and they're a, they're a good feel-good story, and the crazy crowd at, at Citizens Bank Park have been fun to watch. They've just energized that Phils team. But the Astros, oh boy, the Astros are no joke. They're stacked at damn near every position, and they've been there before. They have the postseason experience where they're going to get on the big stage and they're not going to be afraid. They're hungry. And having seen the Braves take the title from them on their home turf last year, they're even more ready to take that final step and get that legitimate series title that many people said that they really didn't earn in 17. I think that the Astros are good enough to take the series. Now, of course, I think the Phillies are going to win a couple of games, probably in their home building. I think the Astros win the first two, Friday and Saturday. When the series shifts to Philly, the the Phillies win two of three there. But the series will go back to to Houston, and the Astros will win in six. And they will have a series win that nobody will doubt the legitimacy of them winning. Like I said, and of course, there's a pick that's sure to be wrong, but I think that the Astros send Dusty Baker out a winner, and I think he decides to tearful, I'm retiring, and go out on top, and ain't nobody going to blame you. you. heard it here first. Goodwood pick is Astros in six. We'll take our first time out, come back, and look at what's wrong with the legends. Why is Aaron and Tom Terrific struggling? Coach Goodwood comes back at you after this. Today your last day on Earth because you are being deployed to space tomorrow? Have you just turned 18 and you're ready to get out of your parents' house? Has your granddaughter gotten her boyfriend pregnant? Whatever your reason, you need us at gottagetmarriednow.com. We specialize in last-minute weddings. Active duty, military veterans and retired discounts are available. Visit us at gottagetmarriednow.com.
tuned in to Sports from the Hoodwood, the Internet's premier destination for no-nonsense commentary, thorough analysis, and logical insight on the world of sports. Now here's the man that Wikipedia and Google call for sports fact checks, your host, KJ Green. You are back in the Hoodwood. I am KJ Green, and we are still trying to figure out where Snuffy is. I still think he's gone fishing with Aaron Judge, but that's not important now. Let's go to another Aaron, that being Aaron Rodgers. And with the Vikings on by this past Sunday, I endeavored to get some things done around the hood, would do some laundry, clean up the house, that sort of thing. And of course, being a football junkie the way I am, I basically spent most of the afternoon on the couch watching the Bengals shred up the Falcons, which was an interesting pretty much game all the way around. Now, when that game ended, the uh, Foxes late game, which was at 425 Eastern, had, and it wasn't quite 4 o'clock, so they went to bonus coverage. Love bonus coverage, but it was the Packers. Ugh. So, to, I'm thinking, okay, the Packers are slapping around the Commanders. Why are they going to this game? Wait a minute, the Packers are losing 23-14. to 14. Okay... So the Packers are losing to the Commanders, a team they have no business losing to. And I'm like, okay, what's going on here? I wanted to drop the whole Vince Lombardi. What the hell's going on here? But the Packers were struggling. DC was taking the fight to the Packers and giving them all they could handle. I'm watching this game just going, huh? Aaron Rodgers had less than 150 yards passing when they cut to the game. And the Packers were losing, like I said before, 23 to 14. They closed the gap 23-21, but they would get no closer and was forced to do a, a, a last second, not even a Hail Mary. I mean, I would have been interested to see Aaron Rodgers roll out and chunk one to the end zone like he did against the Lions a few years back and win the game. But he didn't. He threw the ball in the middle of the field. And then they lateraled. And they lateraled. And they lateraled. And then the final throw went through a lineman's hands, skirted out of bounds, game's over, and the Packers lose, and you have this sight of Aaron a- laying face down on the on the on the uh, FedEx field turf. Like, oh, what's happened? What has happened to the once feared Packers offense? Aaron Rodgers won MVP two years running with an absolutely feared offense throwing for close to 5,000 yards both times. But this year, he's a shell of himself. Is the, was Devontae Adams that much of a factor? I, 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 don't, I don't get it. But watching the, the Packers throw the ball around on some multilateral desperation play, it was just sad. It was tragic. I, meanwhile, some 400 miles to the south, Another set of tragic set of set of circumstances were unfolding. Carolina traded away Christian McCaffrey. No one gave them any chance of beating the Buccaneers. I made Tampa Bay my lock of the week. We'll get to that here in, in, in a little bit. But Tampa Bay was supposed to be a stone cold lock. I know the game was in Charlotte. But it didn't matter. Tampa Bay is light years ahead of the Panthers, who seem like they're having a fire sale. Matt Rule has already been fired. Why did the Panthers beat the Buccaneers 21-3? Why did Tom Brady throw a deep pass to Mike Evans to see Mike Evans drop the ball? Mike Evans doesn't drop bombs. He's on my fantasy team for crying out loud. He's dependable. And the Buccaneers couldn't score a touchdown. Couldn't score a touchdown against the Carolina Panthers. I could understand it if it was against the Bengals, the Saints. I could even, as, as poor as the Saints defense has been lately, the 49ers, the Cowboys. I could see that happening. But against the Panthers, Tom Brady looked like, he just looked old. I know Tom Brady's 45 years old. 
I know. But it just seems like what was once a formidable offense has gotten stuck in second gear. They're not converting third downs. They're not controlling the clock. And Todd Bowles is looking lost on the sidelines. And it looks like him and Tom Brady are not on the same page. Matt LaFleur in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers look like they're butting heads. Todd Bowles and Tom Brady in Tampa Bay look like they're butting heads. What's wrong with the legends? Your guess is as good as mine. Is Aaron Rodgers really missing uh, Devontae Adams that much? You know, like the old uh, uh, the Wolverine meme where he's sitting there looking at the picture. You just see Aaron Rodgers sitting there on his bed looking at a picture of Devontae Adams in Las Vegas and going, come back, I need you. He's not gelling. He doesn't trust his receivers. You can tell he doesn't trust his receivers. And in Tampa Bay, as with a, an embarrassment of riches at the wide receiver position that Tampa Bay has, they're not getting it done. And the running game, puny as it is, is so bad, teams are sitting back just daring Tom Brady to the throw. Both of these teams are below 500. If you had a said, beginning of the season, yo, KJ, Seven weeks in the season, neither Green Bay or Tampa Bay are going to have a winning record. I'd have laughed in your face. Now, it's the new reality. Go figure. The Lakers are in trouble. And it ain't even Halloween. I feel bad for rookie coach Darvin Ham. I thought he was going to be a really good, good, uh, coach and the breath of fresh air that the Lakers had needed but he's been put in a situation that is just a mess I mean you got LeBron James who's busily stacking his points and slogging his way to the all-time scoring record held by Kareem at his current pace we're looking at a January countdown I'm pretty sure LeBron's gonna finish with over 40,000 points and probably play last year or two with his son but that's not that's down the road Anthony Davis, he's putting in yield man like work. He's been stacking points, averaging better than 24 and a half points a game. The problem is Russell. Russell Westbrook. His play has a player fallen so off, so fast than Russell Westbrook. Don't call him Russell Westbrook. He'll get mad. But son, you stacking up like stacking him up like Mason. It. Watching Russell Westbrook huck up shots, bricks, is pathetic. He's averaging a mere 10.3 points a game. Remember, this was a guy who averaged a triple-double two straight seasons. I won an MVP because of it. He's not been a factor in any game. And there was that mystifying shot he took against the Blazers. I don't know if you saw it uh, over the past weekend. The, the Lakers were up one with the ball in late in the fourth quarter was under 30 seconds and he jacks up a 16 footer and it bricked. Of course it's Russell Westbrook. The, the Blazers got the board and then took the lead on if you step back three by Dame Lillard and the, the Lakers, they did tie the game with a dunk by LeBron, but they ultimately lost when nobody's bothered to stop Jeremy Grant on a drive bar with the cup. Je- wait, Jeremy Grant? Are you serious, dude? Oh, Lord. I mean, I'm not, I'm not no diss to the former Syracuse Orange. He's a, he's a good service, serviceable type player. But Jeremy Grant winning a ball game for you is just obscene. Had it been Dame Lillard, he had 41 in the game. Nobody would have faulted the Lakers for being able to stop Dame Lillard. It's really hard to stop Dame Lillard. He's that type of dude. But Jeremy Grant on a drive all the way to the cup. And of course, LeBron missed a game-tying jumper at the end of the game. And predictably, the haters went on about LeBron not being clutch. Chapter 1041. But the real fault 
was Russell Westbrook. He took the shot that I mentioned before with 27.3 seconds to go. 18 on the shot clock. Why are you taking a shot? You've got the lead. You've got the ball. And you're taking a 16-footer. Why not take the ball to the cup? Then why the pull-up? I mean, it was so bad. Yusef Nurkic was daring Westbrook to shoot the ball. Shoot that pill, kid. Go on, take that shot. I don't care. You've got a seven-footer that's supposed to guard you. And he dares you to take the shot. And you take the bait. And you break the jumper. Then when he was asked about it, Westbrook said he wanted a two-for-one situation. What? Why do you want a two-for-one situation when you have the lead and the ball? That made no sense. I mean, Russell Westbrook is a veteran. And he should know better. Real talk. Is it time to break up the Lakers? Is it really time to just blow it all up and start over again? I mean, the team self-destructed last year, especially after LeBron got hurt, and they more or less quit on Frank Vogel, who I still think got a bum rap. I still think Frank Vogel was a damn good coach. But the team quit on him, and the Lakers just got rid of him. I got no beef with Darvin Ham. I I still think he's going to be a good coach in this league, but I don't think with the Lakers. This squad is bloated and disjointed, and they don't play together. I mean, nobody respects Russell Westbrook anymore. They don't respect him as a playmaker. He just hucks up off-balance shots, and everybody's like, whatever, self-check. The Blazers had so little respect for for Russell Westbrook, they put a seven-footer on him. Nurkic is a seven-footer. A center for crying out loud. They felt Westbrook was not going to drive on him. No, they did. They think that he was. He would. They would beat him with a jump. They didn't think he would beat them with a jumper. Now he's one of those they call on a playground self check. Now you don't want to get the title of self check. That's the worst title you could ever have playing basketball. That means no one needs to check this dude. He's not a threat to score. And Westbrook is a shadow of his once domineering self. He was a somebody who you had to put a man on at all times. And he still would beat you to the cup. He could still beat you with jumpers, but not, not anymore. He's not a threat to score. And the, he's hurting the Lakers. His play is hurting the Lakers. And, and Ham is leaving him on the bench for long stretches of time. As of this taping, they're still winless. LeBron can't do it all by himself. Not at his age. I mean, he'll get his points, but he can't carry a team like he used to. AD, he can pick up some of the slack, but most teams know, stop LeBron, stop AD, or at least let them get theirs, let them get their 24 and 20, and take your chances with the rest of the team. Who's going to pick up the slack? Patrick Beverly? (laughs) Certainly ain't going to be Russell Westbrook. And like I said, Darvin Ham benched Russell Westbrook for a long stretch of the fourth quarter in that game before bringing inserting him late. This this is just getting bad. And, and I really don't have a solution. I mean, other than blowing the team up and starting over. Let's take a time out. I'll come back with NFL Week 8 picks. Get a little better last week. We'll improve on that so we can get done. Sports and Goodwood comes back at you.
You are tuned in to Sports from the Hoodwood, the internet's foremost location for opinion, analysis, and insight on the world of sports. Here now is the man banned from sports trivia contests in 38 states and 4 Canadian provinces, and not to mention Guam. Your host, KJ Green. You are back in the Hoodwood. My name is KJ Green, and let's get to the NFL Weekend Picks. And it was another solid week last week, to be sure. I went 10-4, and four, and I'm hoping that winning the Thursday Nighter was a solid harbinger of things to come. So, once again, I'll keep it brief, keep it short, the intro, and that, that is. And for your review, approval, and perusal, I'll bring you the NFL Week 8 picks. Now, the odds are being provided by ESPN, as usual, for comparison and per- entertainment purposes only. I'm only telling you this because I know way too many bookies, and I can't pay them. They know better than to come after me for your money on your bad bets. So you bet the lines and lose, it's on you. Do check 506sports.com for an excellent coverage map of the games in your area. All the games I'm listing are in Eastern Daylight Time. Now for the good people in Denver and Jacksonville, the games in your area for that lo- the game in London will be shown locally. Again, check your local listings for the venue in your area. The Chiefs and the Chargers are the teams on the bye week this week. Let's get started with the Thursday night game. The 4-3 and three Ravens taking on the 3-4 and four Buccaneers at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa. 8-15 kickoff on Amazon Prime. The Buccaneers are three-point favorites. Last week, the Ravens defeated the Browns 23-20, while the Buccaneers lost to the Panthers 21-3. Now, the Ravens finally got a close one to fall their way, sliding by the lowly Browns, while the Buccaneers just look lost in a putrid showing in Carolina. I think Lamar Jackson is ready to finally re-solidify his QB1 status and will do so against the Buccaneers defense. And I think the play of Tom Brady was not a one-off. And I'm going to start off early because I forgot to, for some reason, forget to pick the upset last week. So we get it out of the way. Upset of the week is Baltimore. Let's go to the Sunday game, shall we? The games of October 30th. This is a Fox doubleheader week. Our first game is in Wembley Stadium in London. The 2-5 and five Broncos taking on the 2-5 and five Jaguars. It's a 9.30 a.m. kickoff on ESPN+. Plus. So that means it's only on the streaming service. Check your local cable provider for the ability to get that game in your area. Last week... Uh, Before I get that, the Jaguars are three-point favorites. Last week, the Broncos lost to the Jets 16-9, while the Jaguars lost to the Giants 23-17. Maybe it's a good thing this game is in London, with a limited viewing audience. To make folks outside of Denver and Jacksonville, who I'm sorry to have to watch this game, to make anyone else to watch this train wreck will be cruel, and if you're going to watch this game, you must have some sort of sadomasochistic tendency in you. I'm not going to watch it. It's too early in the morning. But the Broncos simply have no offense, and their defense has had to do too much to keep them in the games. And yet, they still look like they're getting run over. The Jags lack an identity, and they just cannot finish games, and that is a problem. I'll probably still be asleep when this game kicks off, and I will not spoil my brunch appetite watching it. I can't trust either team, to be honest, and without the benefit of the home field, it's hard to pick either. I'm just going to flip a coin. Pick is Jacksonville. Moving to the 1 o'clock games, we start out with the 2-5 and five Panthers at the 3-4 and four Falcons. Game being played at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. 1 p.m. kickoff on Fox. The Falcons are 4.5-point favorites. Last week, the Panthers defeated the Buccaneers 21-3, while the Falcons lost to the Bengals 35-17. Everyone, yours truly included, wrote the Panthers off, especially when they sent Christian McCaffrey to the Niners. Then they raise up with their arguably their finest performance of the season and trash the Bucks. Meanwhile, the Falcons looked like they were running in slow motion as the Bengals sped by them for an easy win. Is this a precur- precursor? Not really. The Falcons have some weapons on offense, and the Panthers' defense won't play that good on the road. The pick is Atlanta. Next on the docket, we have the 3-4 and four Cardinals taking on the 5-1 and one Vikings. The game being played at U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis. It's a 1 o'clock kickoff on Fox. The Vikings are 3.5-point favorites. Last week, the Cardinals defeated the Saints 42-34, while the Vikings were on their bye. 
The Cardinals won a wild shootout last Thursday in the desert against the Saints, but the Vikings defense present a heartier challenge for Kyler Murray. And had to boot that it's not likely the Kirk Cousins will throw two, count them two, pick sixes like Andy Dalton did last week. To the chagrin of many Vikings fans, Cousins has played relatively error-free. And the redoubtable running of Dalvin Cook and the receiving of Justin Jefferson helped matters greatly. The Vikings like playing closed games to my gray, more my beard, but they've been on the right side of the ledger so far. The Cards themselves like playing close games, but the results have been dicier. I'll trust the Vikings more at home, though the Cardinals do seem to play better on the road. The pick is Minnesota. Next on the docket, we have the 3-4 and four Bears taking on the 5-2 and two Cowboys at AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas. 1 o'clock kickoff on Fox. The Cowboys are 9.5-point favorites. Last week, the Bears defeated the Patriots 33-14, while the Cowboys defeated the Lions 24-6. The Bears shocked a lot of people, me included, by rolling into Foxborough, spotting the Pats an early deficit, then roaring back to blast them. This task won't be that easy facing a rugged Polk squad who've only allowed 20 or more points one time this season. They lost that game, but other than that, they do not give up points, and they do so grudgingly. Dak Prescott is looking like he is easing back into the starting lineup, and the Polk's offense in reality doesn't need that much many scores to get a win, especially at home. The pick is Dallas. Next on the docket, we have the 4-3 and three Dolphins taking on the 1-5 and five Lions. Game being played at Ford Field in Detroit. 1 o'clock kickoff on CBS. The Dolphins are three-point favorites. Last week, the Dolphins defeated the Steelers 16-10, while the Lions lost to the Cowboys 24-6. Now, the Dolphins started out fast against the Steelers, and their defense carried them to a tougher-than-expected win. They now face a Lions team that at one time had an impressive offense, but now they have forgotten how to score points, and they still are giving up points at a frightening clip. Now, while the Dolphins can play inconsistent at times, they do just look better with Tua Tagovailoa at quarterback. They should have no real problem here. The pick is Miami. Next on the docket, we have the 2-4 and four Raiders taking on the 2-5 and five Saints. Caesar Superdome in New Orleans, 1 p.m. kickoff on CBS. The Raiders are two-point favorites. Last week, the Raiders defeated the Texans 38-20, while the Saints lost to the Cardinals 42-34. Now, the Raiders' offense looks sharp against a weak Texans team and should have another opportunity to rack up yards and points against a Saints team that is looking worse and worse every week. Andy Dalton is fast proving why he is on his third different team in the last three years. And the Saints' offense is looking like they're ready to send out one as Orleans Parish for healthy bodies at the skill positions. The pick is lost, baby. Let's take a timeout. Come back with the second half of the NFL picks. Today your last day on Earth because you are being deployed to space tomorrow? Have you just turned 18 and you're ready to get out of your parents' house? Has your granddaughter gotten her boyfriend pregnant? Whatever your reason, 
you need us at gotta get married now.com. We specialize in last minute weddings. Active duty, military veterans and retired discounts are available. Visit us at gotta get married now.com. You're tuned in to Sports from the Hoodwood, the Internet's foremost location for the most honest insight, thorough analysis, and unfiltered opinion on the world of sports. Now, once again, here's the man of the hour, After Hours, your host, K.J. Green. And on we go in the Hoodwood, the continuation of the NFL Week 8 picks. Next on the docket, we have the 3-4 and four Patriots taking on the 5-2 and two Jets, game being played at MetLife Stadium in East Rutherford, New Jersey, 1 p.m. kickoff on CBS. The Patriots are one-and-a-half-point favorites. Last week, the Patriots lost to the Bears 33-14, to while the Jets defeated the Broncos 16-9. to Now, the Pats got steamrolled last Monday by the Bears. Wait, wait, what? Wait, what? Is that, yeah, 33-14. And they hit now to Gotham to face a surging Jets team that think they are ready to supplant them as the Bills' main rival in the AFC East. Mac Jones has a starting job back, but for how long? I think he's going to be on a short leash, especially with the big play ball-hawking roughneck defense that the Jets possess. The Jets' offense, eh, they're all right. They ain't going to scare anybody, but I suspect the best, the Jets at home should be able to carry the day. Pick the New York Jets. Next on the docket, we have the 2-5 and five Steelers taking on the 6-0 and o Eagles at Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia. 1 p.m. kickoff on CBS. The Eagles are 11-point favorites. Last week, the Steelers lost to the Dolphins 16-10 while the Eagles were on a bye. Now, before the start of the season, this battle of the Keystone State looked intriguing. Now it looks like a beatdown waiting to happen. I know, I know, the Steelers seemingly find some way to stay in games. And if this game was in Pittsburgh, I'd be extra cautious on picking against them. But if it's one place that Steeler fan, who usually travels in in great bunches, one place that they know better than to try to go is Philly. And Eagle fans will make this a miserable experience for the Jersey boy and Kenny Pickett, who's still going through a tough bit of growing pains as a Steeler's signal caller. This game will not be particularly close. The pick is Philadelphia, and it is the Hoodwood Lock of the Week. Next on the docket, we have the 4-2 Titans taking on the 1-4-1 Texans. Game being played at NRG Stadium in Houston, 4-5 kickoff on CBS. The Titans are two-point favorites. Last week, the Titans defeated the Colts 19-10, while the Texans lost to the Raiders 38-20. Titans like winning grimy games. That's a fact. They did so against the Colts and now have the lead the AFC South by themselves. They had Houston take on the Texans squad that just can't get out of its own way. Wasting the brilliant running of Damian Pierce. Now healthy Derrick Henry makes this a long day for the Texans. The pick is Tennessee. Next on the docket, we have the 3-4 and four Commanders at the 3-3-1 three, three and one Colts. Game being played at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. 425 kickoff on Fox. The Colts are three-point favorites. Last week, the Commanders defeated the Packers 23-21, to while the Colts lost to the Titans 19-10. to Can somebody tell me why this was a good idea to put this game on 425? Usually, 425 games are primetime games, you know, the, with the number one Fox announcing crew. Well, I guess it was billed as a return of Carson Wentz against the guy that ran him out of town for. There's one small problem. Wentz is hurt, and the guy that ran him out of town... Matt Ryan, remember him? He's on the bench. So, you have Sam Ellenberg. Who? Sam Ellenberg. Uh, He's getting his first start against the redoubtable Taylor Heineke, who has at least won a couple of games in this league. 
Yeah, that really gets a pulse rating. Be still my beating heart. If the Colts remember how to use Jonathan Taylor, they could give the Commanders fresh off a surprise win of, over the Packers. Uh, they could give them a game, but I wouldn't bet my Bearcat tickets on it. I get the feeling I'm going to be wrong no matter who I pick, though, but I'm going to go with Washington. Next on the docket, we have the 3-4 and four 49ers taking on the 3-3 three and three Rams at SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, California. 425 kickoff on Fox. The 49ers are a point and a half favorites. Last week, the 49ers defeated the, I uh, beg your pardon, the 49ers lost to the Chiefs 44 to 23 while the Rams were on their bye. Now, the Niners' once formidable defense got shredded by a bevy of Chet sweeps by the Chiefs. They head down state to face a rested Rams team looking for payback for a humiliating primetime defeat four weeks ago. The Rams' offense has had a few weeks to figure out what has kept their once high power offense stuck in low gear. I think that the Niners' once feared defense has gotten exposed and the Rams will get some get back at home. The pick is the Los Angeles Rams. Next on the docket, we have the 6 1 Giants at the 4 3 Seahawks. Games being played at Lumen Field in Seattle. It's a 425 kickoff on Fox. The Seahawks are three point favorites. Last week, the Giants. Defeated the Jaguars 23-17, while the Seahawks defeated the Chargers 37-23. This is a sneaky good matchup between a pair of the NFC's more surprising squads. The GMN keep winning tight games that you expect them to lose. And while enough can't be said about Geno Smith and the suddenly respectable Seahawks, rookie running back Kenneth Walker is making that offense go. And he's looking more and more like the real deal. But He will have his biggest test against a rugged G-Man defense that seems to come up aces at the right times. It's a tough game to call, to be perfectly honest. I think the G-Man do continue their hot start and may continue to make a case for rookie Brian DeBow to win NFL Coach of the Year. Pick here is the New York Giants. Sunday night game is the 3-4 Packers at the 5-1 Bills. Game being played at Highmark Stadium in Orchard Park, New York. 8-20 kickoff on NBC. The Bills are 10.5 point favorites. Last week, the Packers lost to the Commanders 23-21 while the Bills were on a bye. The Packers are a mess, period. And Aaron, as I mentioned before, has no trust in his receiving core and is longing for the days we could just chunk it up to Devontae Adams. The defense is a mess, the running game is non-existent, and they are catching the rested Bills at the exact wrong time. Rodgers is saying the right things, telling people to believe that not to believe in them, and they want to be the underdog that no one takes seriously. The problem is the Packers are growing into the dog that no one takes seriously. Josh Allen and company are no joke on offense. And that defense plays with a decided chip on their shoulder. Mix in a frenzy Bills Mafia in prime time. And while I have, will not call the lock, that game has already been locked. There's already been a lock established. The Packers are in some kind of trouble. Book it. The pick is Buffalo. Finally, our Monday night game is 4-3 and three Bengals at the 2-5 and five Browns. Game being played at First Energy Stadium in Cleveland. 8-15 p.m. kickoff on ESPN. The Bengals are three-point favorites. Last week, the Bengals defeated the Falcons 35-17, while the Browns lost to the Ravens 23-20. Now, the Bengals have kept their baby face franchise quarterback mostly upright the last five weeks, and the Bengals have went 4-1 and one to slug their way back into the AFC North race. And into the conversation as one of the AFC's elite. They traveled north to face their in-state divisional rival, and... That team just cannot, cannot seem to catch a break. The Bengals are riding their dynamic passing game and pit and their pick your poison trio of Jamar, the human cheat code chase, Tyler Boyd, and T. Higgins. Add in an emerging tight end Hayden Hurst to the mix, and the Browns have a potential nightmare on their hands if they don't get to Burrow. The problem is the Bengals don't play good in primetime games. They don't play good on the road and in primetime. That may be a problem. The Bengals have lost 14 of their last 15 primetime road games. And at boot, their dismal 3-7 and Monday night record does not bode well. Something's got to give. 
I'm not picking the Browns. Sorry. The pick is Cincinnati. And there you have it. Last week went 10 and 4. The lock and upset were incorrect. Primarily upset because I didn't pick the upset, so I marked that as incorrect. Overall, 61, 46, and 1, 4 and 3 on both the locks and upsets. Timeout. Our final timeout of the day. Come back with the Hoodwood Hot Five. Fat Dap, Head Slap, and the final word from the Wood. Sports from the Head. <laughs> Sports from the Hoodwood heads down the home stretch after this. Today your last day on Earth because you are being deployed to space tomorrow? Have you just turned 18 and you're ready to get out of your parents' house? Has your granddaughter gotten her boyfriend pregnant? Whatever your reason, you need us at gottagetmarriednow.com. We specialize in last-minute weddings. Active duty, military veterans and retired discounts are available. Visit us at gottagetmarriednow.com. Sports from the Hoodwood, the internet's foremost location for no-nonsense commentary, insight, and opinions on the world of sports. Here now live in living color, black by popular demand, your host, KJ Green. Rounding third and headed for home here in the Hoodwood, let's finish up strong with the Hoodwood Hot Five, back that pit slap, and the final word from the Wood. Hoodwood Hot 5, really no real big changes this week. I mean, we'll look over the five top teams that I have ranked in the Hoodwood. Number five, we have the 8-0 Clemson Tigers, fresh off of a 27-21 win over Syracuse. They're off next week, so they have no worries about falling out of the Hoodwood Hot 5 because I, I don't punish teams that don't play, which is why our number four team is Michigan. They were off this this past week, and they have a pretty good, pretty big test i would say a test anytime you're playing your in-state rival it's always a big deal and playing hosting sparty is going to be a real test for the wolverines even though michigan state is down but they always seem to get up for the blue and you can pretty much throw they say throw the records out sparty's going to get up for michigan and michigan had better take care 
take take care that they don't get caught looking ahead to the softer part of their schedule because after playing Sparty, they have Rutgers, Nebraska, and Illinois. I know, yawn. So if they can beat Sparty, I see no real reason why the Wolverines can't be 11-0 when they take on the Buckeyes. Our number three team is Tennessee. They're 7-0, fresh off of a win off over Alabama. They get the mighty Skyhawks of Tennessee Martin. Why do SEC teams play these cookie games in the middle of their conference schedule? I mean, I know they had Alabama one week, and then they've got uh, uh, they've got Georgia uh, in, on November fifth. So you have Alabama, a cookie team, a bye, and then Georgia. Everybody says, "Well, it's a tough schedule. They need it." You know, play these cookie teams in September. Don't play them in October, November. But right now, they're still number three, and they'll be in that number three spot next week because they are off. Our number two team, Georgia, was off last week. And they have Florida in Jacksonville. And there's been talk about Georgia and Florida taking this series uh, back to campuses. They play the game in Jacksonville. It's called the world's largest outdoor, outdoor cocktail party. But then, of course, everybody got PC, and they stopped calling it that. Georgia and Florida have had some really great games in Jacksonville, and it's always a big deal for the city of Jacksonville for that game. But I still think that Georgia and Florida should be on campus. That game should be at Sanford Stadium when they play in in Athens, and it should be in Ben Hill Griffin when it's in Gainesville. You need, I would like to see home field advantage. Now, a lot of people say, well, this game is the equivalent of the Texas-Oklahoma game. They play in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas every year. Texas and Oklahoma, pretty much the center of those two uh, schools is Dallas. And even though the Cotton Bowl is a smaller venue than either Daryl K. Royal or, um, was it Gaylord? It's like this Gaylord family, I believe. Yeah, Gaylord Family Stadium in Oklahoma in uh, Norman. Even though the Cotton Bowl is smaller, it's got a real special feel to it. And I don't think that they should take that away from Dallas. Jacksonville, this, 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 this crowds have been a little sketchy. And TAA Bank Stadium is way smaller than either Sanford or Ben Hill Griffin. Maybe time to move these games back on the campus. But I digress. Our number one team in the hood would high five, of course, is the Ohio State Buckeyes. They were off last week. And they have Penn State in Happy Valley. And I checked that. They are playing in Happy Valley. That is going to be a real test for Ohio State. Even though Penn State isn't in national title contention anymore. If they got waxed by Michigan, they still are a formidable foe. And I still think that if Ohio State doesn't take care, they could get upset and be knocked out of the, out of the national championship rankings or national ship, championship contention. But I still think that C.J. Stroud and company will have enough to get that win. That's my hot five in the Hoodwood. What's yours? Our Fat Dap Head Slap of the Week. Now, of course, everybody knows that I'm a big University of Cincinnati fan. Former, I'm an alum, so I'm going to give the Fat Dap to one of my own, I should say. Head Coach Luke Fickle. Head Coach of my beloved alma mater, University of Cincinnati football team, with its 29-27 win over SMU that put more gray hairs in my beard than I would really care to, care to divulge. But a 29-27 win over SMU on Saturday, Fickle became the school's all-time winningest football coach, surpassing Rick Minner, who had the record almost 20 years. Now, where Minner needed 117 games to get 53 wins, he's also the school's losing his coach with 63 losses, and he never had more than eight wins in a single season, doing that one time in 1997, their only bowl-winning season. But... Fickle, on the other hand, only needed 70 games. And that was after a 4-8 start in his first year. He has went 50-8 over the last uh, last five seasons, winning two bowl games and making uh, the New Year's Year's Day six game against Georgia in 2020 
and of course the college football playoff last season. Fickle is, has turned that culture around in my, for my alma mater, where there were decent crowds. You know, you have your occasional you know big crowd here and there, but now Bearcat tickets are hard to get. There's a winning program and a winning culture. Of course, I'm a proud season ticket holder, but that's neither here nor there. Fat dap to Luke Fickle on being the Bearcats' all-time winningest coach. Here's 54 more. Our head slap of the week, we're going to turn back to basketball, to Ben Simmons. Now, he let the wily Ja Morant bait him into fouling him late in the fourth quarter in the Nets-Grizzlies game in Memphis the other night. Now, Simmons had five fouls and was guarding the very ultra-quick Morant who let an inbounds pass roll and roll and roll and roll past midcourt before he picked up the ball. Then he stood there with the ball, daring Simmons to come out and try to, you know, guard him tight. Simmons, who despite all of his gifts, can be situa- situa- situ- situationally, situationally, that's right, can be, <laughs> can never say words right, he can be situationally unaware at times and in this definition, oh, let, me, let me try that again. Cut. Let's try that again. Head slap. Marker. Our head slap of the week goes to Ben Simmons, who let Ja Morant bait him into a disqualifying foul the other night in Memphis. Now, late in the fourth quarter of the Nets-Grizzlies game in Fed at the FedEx Forum, Simmons, who had five fouls, was guarding Ja Morant. He had let an inbounds pass roll and roll and roll and roll past midcourt before picking it up. Then he stood there with the ball. Simmons, who despite all of his gifts, can be as situationally unaware as the definition will allow, then tried to crowd Morant at the uh, midcourt sideline, the the kind of Bermuda Triangle, where they say don't stop if you're there, if you're dribbling the ball. Don't pick up the ball and stand right there in that short corner. But he ran up to try to guard him, and he fouled him. That was his sixth foul. Six fouls in the NBA, you're gone. He got the disqualifying foul, and Morant standing there laughing at him, and Ben Simmons is like, what I do? You're you, you, you child ahead. You, 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 you're supposed to be aware of the situation, how many fouls you have, the situation, how much time is left, what you need to bring to your team. Bad enough you brick layups. Bad enough you can't shoot free throws. You were supposed to hang your you were able to hang your hat on defense. And you can't do that? Head slap to Ben Simmons for being just a chowder head. And now, without much further ado, let's go to the final word from the wood. I try to stay politic neutral here in the hoodwood, not because I'm worried about offending anyone. I keep my politics to myself and use this forum as a safe space where we can talk about sports, have a few laughs, and take some time to talk, tune out the stupid things that are going on in the world today. There are times where the hoodwood has stood for social justice and will continue to do so. I will not shirk from that. When the time is appropriate, I'll discuss that at length. That said, I'm going to pick a fight right now. Now, my mom has always said, don't go looking for fights. Fight back only to protect yourself. Those words usually ring true, but in the case of Charlie Kirk, this will be different. Kirk is a well-known conservative political pundit. I really don't care for his politics or more or less ignore his political babble and focus instead on his insipid rant about diversity in the National Hockey League. Now, at first admitting that he hasn't watched a hockey game in seven years, he's suddenly alarmed by the, quote, pandering to woke ideology, diversity, equity, inclusion, and affirmative action guidelines. Hockey, of all sports, he's offended. Clutch the pearls. Uh, Of all sports, hockey, Kurt Rantz. It was like he was disturbed and offended that there may be people of color playing hockey. Oh, my Lord, black folks on the ice. It's something that I just did not understand. 
his logic that there are no rinks in the inner city and how are people of color going to play? Did anyone inform this twerp that there are people of color in the suburbs? I grew up in the suburbs. Last I checked, I'm a person of color and I can skate and I can hockey skate. There are people of color who do play hockey. Now, granted, there aren't that many, but there aren't none. There are some. Of the makeup of the NHL, there are 7.2% of the NHL population that are Hispanic and 6.8% that are black, African-American, or African-Canadian. I hate that term, African-American, African-Canadian. I just like black. But that, but that's neither here nor there. He makes the inane comparison, well, why aren't there white people in the, in the NBA? Why don't they want to diversify the National Basketball Association? Like, hoops are the exclusive domain of black people. Now, I can name a number of white basketball players, and I'd be willing to bet you any money, I'll be willing to bet you any money that Kirk couldn't name a black hockey player. And he probably could struggle to name a white American basketball player. Not like he really wants to. It's, his comparisons and arguments are ignorant and downright stupid with the racist dog whistles that it seems that his ilk like to listen for. He says that all hockey coaches are white. So what? Did he ever think that players of color might want to play the game and then branch into the coaching ranks eventually? Have something to aspire to? I grew up watching Grant Fuhr, the stoic uh, hot goaltender for the uh, great Edmonton Oilers teams of the 80s. So I knew there were black players in the NHL. I saw players like Jerome Ginla, the great player for the Calgary Flames, uh, Donald Brashear, Mike Greer, Kevin Weeks, and Anson Carter. Players who looked of my complexion playing hockey. And you have today players like P.K. Subban, Wayne Simmons, and K. Andre Miller among some of the great players of color in the NHL today. And this leads me to my second point, or second fight I want to pick. Toronto Sun hockey writer Steve Simmons, who, like Kirk, has a much better work, unlike Kirk, has much. Un- Try it again. This leads me to my second beef with Toronto Sun hockey writer Steve Simmons, who, unlike Kirk, has a much better working knowledge of hockey. He's a hockey beat writer. But like this other twerp, likes to use the same tired dog whistles in regards to race. He has openly disparaged the plight of players of color who have openly complained about racial discrimination being called names, and having stupid stuff like having bananas thrown on them on the ice. He discounts it. He tells them it's not a big deal. What these players have had to endure to get to the highest level and what some are doing at minor league levels, what they have to endure is shameful. And a writer like Simmons who could use his platform to openly champion these players and asks why these things are going on, instead disparages them, calls them weak-minded, and wonders, well, these players who are complaining, are they really coachable? Are they really playing? Are they really worried about playing? It, It is something that is annoying to me. And to see someone like Simmons, who I said has a powerful form, not use it, is just ridiculous and sad. So why am I bringing these goobers up? I want them. I'm laying down a challenge right now. I'm calling you, calling you out. Charlie Kirk, Steve Simmons, drop me a line. KJ Green at sportsfromthehoodwood.com. Let's set something up. I want to openly debate either one of you on your thoughts and views about racial discrimination in sports, about people of color in hockey. I want to know more about, I know I know more about the sport than Charlie Kirk. I have more knowledge about cocky in my pinky than Charlie Kirk has in his body 10 times over. I was watching the game before he was a gleam in his daddy's eye. Let's keep this straight. And now, I'm not going to challenge Simmons on his knowledge of the game. That I'm not going to do. But I would challenge him 
on what he thinks about diversity in the sport. Someone needs to call this guy out. Put him on front street. So I'm throwing down the gauntlet. I'm laying out the challenge. My email address is kjgreen at sportsfromthehoodwit.com. Send me a time. I'll name the time. I'm like Club Align Lang. Any time, any place you want to do it, let's do it. Let's debate. I won't cut it up. I won't edit it. We'll just sit down like a Zoom call and we'll debate for 10 or 15 minutes, if not longer. It'll be a feature on Sports from the Hoodwood. But, of course, you being the major people, you're not going to respond to me. Kirk Simmons, step up and get your cranium cracked. Hey, Charlie, I know I can. I know hockey. I can educate you. Steve, I dare you to get in the ring. Step on up. But I know you're afraid. I know you won't. You see me as a small podcaster. It isn't worth your time. I'm a little bitty state taking on the big giant. That annoying little mutt that you won't regard. I think of myself as Hoodwood University challenging big state you. And you're afraid that the little guy like me might embarrass you. It ain't no might about it. I will embarrass you. Humiliate you. Make you look like the chumps and fools that you are. Step up if you got the guts. If you got the cojones. Step up in the hood wood. Come get you some. That's the final word from the wood. With the music coming up in the background, you know that means your time in the hood wood is just about done. And I thank you so much for your visit this week. If you want to send me an email, I have a new email address as I detailed earlier. KJ Green at sportsfromthehoodwood.com. Questions, comments, show topic ideas, and yes, criticism. I welcome your emails and your correspondence, and I will try to get back to you in a timely manner. Now, the show can be seen on a number of venues video with YouTube and Facebook, as well as the Sports from the Hoodwood website, where you can have an archive of previous shows. You can also catch the audio version of this podcast. Spotify, Amazon News, Stitcher, iMovie. If you don't have it on your favorite podcast provider, ask for it. We'll try to get it to you. It's on a number of great podcast providers. Look for us, we'll be there. Also I'm on Twitter, KJGreen20 and KJGreen. As well as a send me a tweet, and I'll get you back as quickly as possible. I'm still on Facebook though, like Dan Productions Enterprises, which also has a show archive. Thanks to Great Pictures for their immense help in making the show even better. And of course, for all the staff here at Blue, uh, Black Banner Productions and Enterprises, if I said it correctly, all the staff at Black Banner Productions and Enterprises help produce the show as well. The man snuffy in the background, I should say, at ground. Until next time, fellow sports fans, I'm KJ Green, 30. Sports from the Hood Wood is a Black Bandit Productions and Enterprises presentation of a 551 Audio and Films production.